Hi there, this is Craig Beck, and we're about to go live with today's coaching session. If you would like to come on as a guest, either to get some free coaching or to talk about your own journey to sobriety, please go to www.craigbeck.com forward slash live. Okay, let's go. Hey, how are you doing? Good afternoon. This is Craig Beck from StopDrinkingExpert.com. Welcome into a live stream on YouTube where you can ask me anything. Uh, so I can now see you wherever you're watching, whether that be Facebook or uh, YouTube. Well, when I say see you, I mean I can see your comments. <laughs> it's nothing weird. Uh, so if you've got any questions about quitting drinking, uh, alcohol, problems in general, or if you just want to share your successes, now is the time to do it. And uh, please post away and I'll try and answer as many questions as I can. I'm just jumping on to do a live stream today because it's about time. I haven't done one for a couple of weeks. And I did a coaching session this morning with a client in Europe and it was a familiar story. And you know, I've been doing this for about, well, over 10 years now. And there are probably a dozen stories that I hear time and time again from drinkers around the world because, you know, we're, when we're all in this loop of alcohol use, we're all basically lying to ourselves to justify doing something that's really insane. Drinking poison for fun, even if it is diluted, is an insane thing to do. And so you can't, you know, the, the brain must apply order to chaos. It can't just leave that nonsense there. And so we're, we're compelled to come up with a, a justification. Oh, well, you know, it seems insane that I'm drinking diluted poison, but my boss is an asshole or my love life is miserable or I'm in a broken relationship and so on and so on. So we're all coming up with plausible deniability to defend the uh, indefensible. Um, uh, let's say there's a couple of people. Hi, Cynthia. Uh, I'll, I'll try and come back to your question. Hi, Virginia. Hi, Paul. Uh, Paul's 19 months alcohol free. Thanks to your books. Very, very good. Well done, Paul. Hi, James. James Redford, first on. <coughs> so uh, this client I was talking to this morning, he said, uh, he said, look, Craig, most of the time I can control my drinking. Uh, he said, but sometimes and it's getting more often. I lose control and I binge drink. And he said, I'm, I'm just debating whether I should be quitting drinking completely or if there's a way of getting in control so I don't do these binge sessions. And look, the, the, the reality here is trying to moderate your drinking, A, doesn't work. Because if it did work, my website wouldn't exist. What you think, you know, every, people with a drinking problem didn't try and cut back a bit first? Of course they did. You know, when I first went to my doctor, my GP, and said, I'm worried about my drinking, do you know what he said to me? He said, well, yes, I agree. Having heard what you're drinking, you should maybe cut back a bit. No shit, Sherlock. That's why I'm here. I know what I should be doing. How do I do it? So trying to moderate your drinking doesn't work. It, it's just it's difficult. I'll explain why in a minute. And secondly, it's a miserable existence. Trying to moderate something that you desperately want is miserable. And that doesn't just apply to alcohol. That's just pure psychology. If you think about it, right? Imagine you bought a, imagine you're a chocoholic and you bought a massive chocolate cake and you put it in your refrigerator and you said to yourself, okay, I'm only allowed one small slice every day. Do you think you'll stick to that? Don't you think that every time you open the refrigerator, you're like, oh, but I've had my slice for today. Now I have to wait for tomorrow. And you'll be picking at it, taking little bits of chocolate off it and tasting it. And you'll be coming up with reasons. Oh, I've had a bad day. Or I went to the gym this morning, so maybe I can have two slices today. You'll come up with all this bullshit and all this nonsense to justify eating more cake than you originally planned to do. Now, Actually, wouldn't it have been much better for there to be no cake there from the beginning? You see what I mean? This is why quitting drinking is so much easier than trying to moderate your drinking. Because, you know, when you invite alcohol to live in your head, which you have done if you're a problem drinker, you've got this little monster that's always whispering in your ear trying to justify you having another drink. And every time you give him what he wants, as in alcohol, you kind of breathe life into him. 
he comes alive. He gets energy and power. The own, I mean, you, you can never get rid of this monster now. Once you've invited him to live in your head, he's there forever. And that might sound depressing, but look, he's a bit of a rogue tenant and you can't evict him. But what you can do is you can squash him down so he's tiny and he's miserable and he's silent and you can't hear him anymore. And that's what you do when you repeatedly ignore what he's telling you to do. Every time he says, come on, you deserve a drink because you had a bad day or because you had a row with your boyfriend or because, because, because. Whatever reason he comes up with, every time you respond, you give him power. Every time you ignore it, you reduce his power by 0.1%. So if you do it long enough, he becomes pathetic, weak, silent, almost like he's not there. I'm missing a few people here. So let's say hello to a few people before I move on with this point. Uh, by the way, you can ask any question you want. I'll be here as long as you need me to be today. Um, if you have questions about quitting drinking, staying sober, or want to share your own success, please do so. Post up a comment, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, hi, Virginia uh, from Broome, Australia. Uh, we got COVID Shetty, uh, love from India. Keep watching your videos when I get ever, ever get an urge. Uh, your message needs to be spread. Thank you very much, COVID. Um, sober for a year now, fantastic. Graham McRobert, how do we slip up but back on track? Why do we slip up when trying to give up? Uh, I'll come back to that, Graham. Um, Ibn Abotris, is that right? So hard at times. Well, it, it, yeah, there are moments, aren't there? Um, Ice Cold says, can't moderate. If I have one, I'll have 10. Correct. Because you only get one decision. You get the first, you get the first decision on the first drink. And then every other decision after that is made by alcohol. That's why the, the evil clown that lives in your head will never suggest to you, hey, why don't you go and drink a bottle of vodka? Doesn't need to have a doesn't need a big cell like that. Doesn't need to convince you to do anything dramatic. It knows it only needs to convince you to have one. Then it's got you. Um, Christ and Fiston, Christ Fiston relapsed again after a month, three times relapsing month after a month. Uh, relapse happens. Look, the, I'll try and remember to come back to all these points. Uh, Robert, nine months tomorrow. Fantastic, Robert. Uh, Hans Yolo, cold beer in the fridge, hard to pass up. Well, it depends on how you look at that container of beer in the fridge. If you look at it like it's a treat, like it's a good thing, like it's going to be a benefit, then, then yeah, it's hard to pass up. But what if there was a, a nice needle and syringe full of heroin in the fridge? Hard to pass up. No? Well, if the answer is no, it's because you don't, you don't ascribe any benefit to heroin. You look at heroin as a bad thing. You look at it as a as a negative thing in your life and it would be very dangerous and terrible to to inject it into your body and you're quite right the problem is that you you've programmed yourself or rather society has programmed us to look at alcohol look at that beer in the fridge and say oh that's nice L just stop for a moment and step back from the illusion and think about what we're doing there we are looking at a can of diluted poison and going, hmm, hard to turn down. And you might think I'm being melodramatic. And, oh, come on, Craig, don't be silly. Don't call beer poison. The ingredient, the active ingredient in beer is alcohol. It is a registered poison. If you buy it in its 100% neat form from a chemistry supply shop, it will come in a container with a skull and crossbones on it, and it will say in big black letters, poison. So... That's not a debatable point, that beer is diluted poison. It's just that society, especially in the Western world, has collectively agreed that it's hard to turn down. It's insane. It's nuts. But that's the world we live in. Graham asked a question, and if I don't answer it now, I'm going to forget about it. Um, how do we slip up back on track? Why do we slip up when trying to give up? Um, I think often, Graham, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, we tend to put on our rose-tinted glasses. This is why I tell people, when you quit drinking, make a day one video just for you. Nobody else is going to see this. Get your phone out and record yourself talking to yourself. 
and you explain to yourself without pulling any punches exactly how miserable alcohol made you what damage it did to your life how it hurt your family family and your children and all those that you love because i'm telling you that you get three months six months one year sober you will forget how bad alcohol hurt you you will look back and you'll remember the great time you had on vacation once when you were drunk you'll look back and remember your college days you'll look back and remember all the parties you've been to where alcohol was flowing and you'll think ah i kind of missed that you will forget about all the horrible stuff, how many arguments it caused, how much it damaged you financially, spiritually, emotionally. You forget all that, and you'll just look back and you'll remember the good times because that's just kind of how we are. So that's reason one, is that we get a distorted view of what happened over time. Secondly, you know, you didn't develop a drinking problem over weeks or years, Graham. You did it over decades. And your subconscious mind learned over that period of time there are many things that you do with alcohol repeatedly. And anything that you do repeatedly, your subconscious mind tries to help out. It says, okay, look, this guy's gonna do this often, so instead of him having to consciously think about it, let's create a program that runs automatically. That'll free up some processing power in his conscious mind and he can work on other things. Can you imagine how difficult life would be if you had to consciously beat your heart to keep yourself alive. And if you stop thinking about it for any moment, you drop down dead. So you had to constantly go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two. It would, it would take over your whole life, wouldn't it? Just counting your heartbeat. And so your subconscious says, okay, look, don't worry about that. I'll do that. And that's what's happened with alcohol. You've used alcohol in specific situations and specific environments so often that your subconscious mind has created a program. Now what happens is you can be sober for three months, six months, and then you go do something that you haven't done in that three or six months. And you activate a program that you didn't even know was there. You go to a wedding and somebody puts a glass of champagne in your hands and says, you need this to toast the bride and groom. And the program runs in your head and it feels like so compelling. I must drink now or you go to the theater, or you go on vacation, or it's Thanksgiving, or it's Christmas, or it's your birthday. Something happens that wakes up the little monster and you get that craving to drink. And it seems logical. It seems like, yeah, well, you know, just one drink won't hurt. So that's why, Graham, you, the, it's kind of two things, you know, rose tinted glasses and tripping over anchors that you placed there years ago. If you relapse, and somebody else said they relapsed, who was that? Um, uh, cries fiston um relapsing look it sucks and it's really disappointing and you, you feel you know terrible about yourself but don't give alcohol more power than you need to it's you know we we build alcohol up into this big evil monster that we can't defeat like it's impossible it's not you know it's it's taking alcohol out of your life is the same as doing any other dramatic big decision you know, deciding to go vegan is a big decision. It's not easy. You don't just wake up one morning and go, yay, I'm a vegan. You slowly think, well, this is the way I want to go, and you become a vegan, and then you find there are challenges and obstacles, and you find you can't buy the clothes you want, and now you go to the restaurant, you've got very limited choices what you can buy, and you see meals that you used to like, and oh, my God, it sucks being a vegan. And it's difficult for a long time until it becomes who you are. And then it becomes easy. It's like going to the gym. First time you go to the gym, it's horrible. Second time's horrible. Fifth time's horrible. Tenth time's horrible. And then eventually, after like maybe two, three weeks of going to the gym every day, eventually you realize one morning you woke up and instead of dreading going to the gym, you felt excited about it. So if you relapse, don't give alcohol too much power. Just dust yourself down and say, okay, stupid mistake, and begin again. All right, because if you if you do what a lot of people do, and that is to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, you know, when you relapse, you say, well, that's it. I obviously can't do this. I might as well just carry on drinking. Is you're just letting the, the drug win. You're just, you know, you wouldn't do that in any other situation. And I'm, I make the comparison that if you went to the doctor one day and he said, uh, he said, unfortunately, you've got 
diabetes. But don't worry because it's very mild and if you take these tablets and you eat the right foods, you should live a perfectly normal life and have a perfectly normal life expectancy. So you leave the doctor and you go off and you take your tablets, but then after one year, one day, you have a very bad relapse. You have a diabetic relapse. Uh, you feel terrible. You have to go to bed for the day. You call in sick from work. You feel awful. You wouldn't respond to that by throwing away the medication, would you? Saying, well, that's it. That doesn't work. So now I'm just going to eat chocolate all the time. You wouldn't do that. You'd just say, okay, had a bit of a relapse. Keep taking the tablets. Back to what worked. That's your mentality. If you relapse when you quit drinking, dust yourself down. Back to what worked. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> uh, let's have a look who we got here. Um, 52, been addicted to beer, just beer, for over 30 years. Bad, really bad. I'm due to go to Glenbur Recovery this Monday morning for a 30-day rehab. I'm a nervous wreck. Um, okay, well, look, don't be nervous because you're doing something really good. You're taking action. That's the most important thing. And, you, the, you know, some, for some people, inpatient rehab works fantastically. In fact, it saves many, many people's lives. Some people it doesn't. Some people need another track. The fact is you've started this journey of change. You've, you've accepted responsibility and you've taken action. And that's huge. Honestly, it's, it's much bigger than you think. The vast majority of people with a drinking problem don't do anything about it. They push it to the back of their head their whole lives, and it eventually kills them. They never do anything about it because it's too painful to consider a life without the thing they believe is the best thing in their life. So you've taken action. You've financially committed, and you've booked yourself into rehab. Awesome. Now, if you want this to work, you just don't stop. Don't stop trying. <coughs> I don't care whether you do my course online or you go to rehab or you go to AA. There is no solution out there that fixes you forever. This is a lifelong commitment that you make through passion and persistence. I don't mean you got a, you've got a struggle for the rest of your life forcing yourself to stay away from alcohol because that's that's a miserable existence i'm saying this is about falling in love with being sober and loving who you are when you're sober and doing whatever it takes to remain in that state so look i i wish you the best of luck embrace it expect there to be ups and downs expect to miss your family but it's one month out of your life and it could save your life. So give it your all. Make a commitment to yourself that you will not quit. You will do everything they say. You will give it 100%. And if you have that mentality, I'm sure it's going to do fantastic things for you. Um, let's have a look here. Uh, Graham, basically one day at a time that I'm back on track. Exactly. And that's, Graham, that's kind of the point of why I was streaming today is because this client I was speaking to this morning, he was saying, look, I don't know whether to cut back or quit completely. And I said, oh, I think you do know. And he said, yeah, you're right. I know I should quit. I just find it hard to express it and to say it. And that's because when you're, use, you know, when you're using alcohol, it is providing a solution to something in your life, albeit slightly ridiculously and um, you know, you're, you're paying a heavy price for that solution. But from your subconscious point of view, alcohol is providing a solution to something. You know, whether that's loneliness or um, depression or anxiety or being in a bad relationship or whatever it is, whatever your particular reason is, you know, your subconscious mind, like we talked about earlier, has been watching you and it's been watching how you cope with these difficult times in your life. And if every time you're depressed, you drink alcohol, the subconscious mind goes, okay, let's create that program because that's obviously, the, that's how he deals or she deals with depression. So let's create the program to free up processing power from the conscious mind. And so for someone, you know, you, you start looking at YouTube and you find people like me saying you should quit drinking forever for the rest of your life. That sounds terrifying. That sounds like horrible, doesn't it? It's like, oh my God. 
How can I live the rest of my life without any alcohol? How will I go on vacation? How will I have Christmas? How will I have Thanksgiving? How will I celebrate my birthday? And it is scary, but you have to understand that you're seeing it from a distorted reality. You're standing inside the madness looking out. And it looks scary out there because it's different. When you get this straight in your head and you're standing outside the madness looking in, you'll be shocked. Your mindset will change. You will start looking at people drinking and think, oh my God, why are they doing that to themselves? In the same way that you could be driving around your neighborhood and see some teenagers sniffing glue out of a tin on a street corner, drooling like zombies. And you could look at them and think, oh my God, why are they doing that? Why are they wasting their lives like that? And the reason you see it like that is because you're outside the madness looking in rather than inside looking out. You know, it's, it's all about this. It's all about this. It's all about our programming and what we believe. Uh, let me have a look. Oh, Alison. Alison writes, if I wasn't married, I'd propose. Um, cannot re recommend uh, this course enough. It's fabulous, and so is Craig. Thank you. Uh, Mary Jane Rushlow, how do you feel about AA? <laughs> I went to AA, Mary Jane. It didn't work for me. Uh, and to be fair, I didn't give it a chance to work because so many things annoyed me that I couldn't, I couldn't tolerate it. Uh, the first thing about AA is when I first went, when I finally plucked up the courage, and it took a you know a lot of the times I went to the church hall where they were having the meeting and parked outside, and I never plucked up the courage to go in. When I finally did, uh, they said it was a very nice man. He said, "Look, just sit down and listen. You don't have to talk today. Uh, just listen to what we're talking about, and then when you're ready, you can talk." I went, "Okay, okay, good." And I sat there. And bearing in mind, I was drinking about one or two bottles of wine a day, probably two bottles of wine a day and probably a bottle of whiskey over the weekend, something like that. Um, and I sat there, and this guy to the right, right of me talked first, and he talked about how he was drinking uh, a liter of vodka every day, uh, and he would throw the bottle out of his car window as he got near home so that his wife wouldn't know. Uh, I listened to the woman next to him say that she'd been given three months to live. And... They told her if she wanted to live a bit longer than three months, she should stop drinking immediately. I listened to this lady over here who'd been, you know, uh, her whole family had deserted her. Her children didn't want to see her ever again. Her husband had left because of her drinking. And I sat there and I came to the conclusion that my drinking was okay. And I actually bought a bottle of whiskey on the way home from AA because I was thinking, wow. I'm just drinking a couple of bottles of wine. I'm not beating up my wife. I'm not doing terrible things. I'm not missing work. I'm not ending up in the drunk tank. I'm not, I must be okay. And so the first thing that AA did for me was to encourage me to drink more. So of course that didn't work out. I was, I carried on drinking for a bit and went back. And then I came back and uh, they said to me in a roundabout way, you're an alcoholic and you always will be. If you get sober, you can call yourself a recovering alcoholic. But you'll always have that label. You will always be an alcoholic. And I thought, my God, how depressing is that? Drink alcohol and get away with it. And that didn't make any sense to me. It would be like, and you know, I talk about this at boot camp, that would be like... Uh, when, oh, I think we're losing signal there a little bit. When you start scratching, I point at you and go, oh, you dirty scratchaholic. What's wrong with you? You're a scratchaholic, and you always will be for the rest of your life. Even when you stop scratching, you'll be a recovering scratchaholic. You wouldn't accept that, would you? You'd go, Craig, are you nuts? The only reason I'm scratching is because you put itching powder in my pants. Yeah, and the only reason I'm at AA is because I repeatedly drank a highly addictive substance, and hey, guess what happened? I got addicted, because that's kind of what's supposed to happen. So to send 
for then someone in a group to say to me, you're an alcoholic, you're a broken person, you always will be, and you can't progress any further in this process until you admit that you're an alcoholic, I thought, no, screw you. It's not, I'm not accepting the label. I'm not accepting the baggage that comes with it. I'm not going to spend the rest of my life sitting in church halls talking about the thing that I hate the most in my life. That sounds miserable. So AA works, but not for many. Success rate is about 9 8%, something like that. You can Google it. About 8% of people stay sober with AA. Uh, and I don't, for me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Fantastic for the 8%. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't accept that as a, a success rate in any other area of life, would you? You know, imagine if you went to the doctor with a bad leg and they said, okay, we're going to do an operation. There's an 8% chance it'll work. <laughs> there's a 92% chance you'll lose the leg. You wouldn't go, okay, go ahead, would you? You'd say, there's got to be something else. Give me something else, anything, anything else apart from that. So... AA, yeah, it's great if it works for you, but the chances are it won't, and uh, there you go. Um, well, I'm missing a few people here now. Uh, Kevin, hi there. Just throwing out there that it's half a year today since I quit drinking. Feel a lot better since. I bet you do, Kevin. Fantastic and well done. Um, Robert, finally had to accept I'm an introvert. Sensitive, loving person, not a problem. Drinking, I wasn't. Not good. Thanks again, Craig. Yeah. You know, it's it's about, you know, quitting drinking, I think, is not just about removing this addictive poison from your life. It's about, it's about opening your eyes and being honest with yourself, having an honesty session with yourself where you say, look, I'm, I'm great at all these things. I'm awesome at this. I'm the best at this. But really, I'm very weak in this area. This scares me. I'm poor at this. And it's accepting who you are as a person, all your strengths, all your weaknesses, and saying, right, I'm going to work on these because the solution I've got at the moment, drinking, is not helping. It's making it worse. I'm going to work on these, and I'm going to embrace these. Uh, and I think that's, you know, quitting drinking is an exciting journey if your mindset is right about it. As long as you believe that you're going somewhere better, and you're not removing something good from your life, then I think it's a very powerful thing you can do. Graham, I have a hobby, AKA building model, model kits, thinking of using it to help me quit. Yeah. Do you, know, you know, Graham, that's what I'm talking about. It's, it's saying, here's my trigger points. Here's the things in my life. This is what makes me drink. In these moments, I drink because. And for me, you know, it was um, an isolation thing. It was a feeling of being alone. I drink when I feel like I'm on my own. And I live in, in a house in the countryside here in Cyprus. There's n I don't have any neighbors. There's just farmer's fields. And when we had the coronavirus lockdown, I felt really down. I felt really depressed because I was looking out and I saw no signs of life anywhere, not even cars going past on the road. And what I do every day now is I go to my boat. I have a boat in the marina. 99% of the time, I don't even take it out of the marina. I just sit on my boat because I see other human beings. I tinker about on my boat. I fix a few things. I say good morning to a few people. I have a few little chats. And that's all I need to keep me centered, keep me in my happy place, keep me in a good place where I don't start getting you know dark thoughts or thinking about drinking or anything like that. So yeah, Bring in a hobby, start something new, learn a language, fill that time that alcohol took with something productive. Not only does it distract you, but it's also a pattern interrupt. It helps the subconscious mind reprogram uh, your belief structure. Uh, Rjack001, thanks, Craig. You helped me. I'm 18 months alcohol free. Awesome. Uh, Alison, first time I ever looked at things way Craig explains in this course, if you follow what Craig says, will totally change the way you think and your life. Thank you very much, Alison. Um, uh, what else we got here? Uh, Zach, please keep doing the live, sh live shows. You're saving lives, mate. Thank you very much, Zach. Well, I, I hope I'm making a difference. Um, Peter, I think this is Peter's responding to the, what's the name? Uh, 
Swindy, who's going into rehab tomorrow. Peter says, you're starting your journey. That's a beautiful thing. He's right. Listen to him, Sandy. Uh, what else we got here? Stephen Nolan. Um, thanks for being so inspiring, Craig. I haven't had a drink for over two years after doing your program. Awesome job, Stephen. Well done. Um, Johnny Cola. We seem to forget that when we were kids and we went to parties that we didn't need alcohol to have fun. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Uh, people say that to me a lot, you know, they say, but, you know, isn't it boring if you don't drink? Isn't it like really dull going to parties if you don't drink alcohol? Uh, it's not true. It's a distorted reality. A, there are civilizations and societies and cultures all around the world that forbid alcohol. Are you telling me they never have a good time? They never have a party where people dance and do silly things and all this sort of stuff? Have you seen a Hindu wedding? They go on for days, not a single drop of alcohol. And you, you, know, you can prove this just going to any McDonald's into the soft play area, find a kid's party and get them all drunk. Do you think this is going to be a better party as a result? Or do you think that it's going to be a disaster and there will be vomit everywhere? I think it's the latter. Rusty, day five. Awesome. Don't forget, Rusty, alcohol, the drug, only has the power to physically hurt you and make you drink for about two weeks. So if you get to 14, 15 days and you're sober, after that, if you want to drink alcohol, you get a craving. It's got nothing to do with the alcohol. It's purely and simply a program misfire in your brain. You don't really want to drink. It's just something's gone a bit crazy. Ignore it. Understand what's happening and ignore it. Hans Yolo, sailboat. No, it's a, it's a motor yacht. It's an Azimut 42, Hans. Um, I just sit there with my air conditioning on drinking coffee. Uh, Julia, uh, oh, it's moved. Uh, Julia says, don't know if this is of any use to anyone, but when I realized I needed to quit, I knew I had to detox properly because of the quantity and regularity of my drinking. I knew I couldn't afford a clinic and there were no free places here. I found eventually that New Zealand has a free home detox where a detox nurse will come to your home three times a day for a week with your meds does your obs and breath tests you until you're safely clear of alcohol. Just thought it worth a mention in case there are others. Julie, you know what? Been talking about this for 11 years now. Didn't know that existed. So thank you very much. I wonder if it's just New Zealand, maybe Australia as well. Uh, I, you know, I'm a little bit skeptical as to whether it would happen in the UK because the health system is so kind of overwhelmed. Maybe I'm wrong. How long, uh, Kay Harper, how long after quitting normal sleep returns? I quit, but I can't sleep. Um, it's impossible to put a time on it, and, and it's actually counterproductive to put a time on it. And I had this with a guy a few years ago from Texas. He got three months, um, he got three months sober, and he was furious with me. He said, Craig, you told me my life would get better. He said, it's three months, and I still can't get to sleep at night. And I said, well, who said it takes three months before you get back to sleep at night? He said, I, nobody. I just assumed that after three months, I'd be sleeping like a baby. And that's the problem. If you put a deadline on something, if you say, well, you know, in six months time, I'm going to be running marathons, then you get to six months time and you can't. <laughs> you get angry and you get essentially get angry at yourself. But then you'll start, you know, psychology doesn't work like that. You're going to start looking for someone to blame. It's different for everyone, Kay. But it's important not to assume that alcohol is the only problem. I used to use this excuse. And, and in reality, Kay, you're a bit like Michael Jackson. You're, you've been taking an anesthetic to get to sleep at night. And in the same reason that Michael Jackson couldn't stop having an anesthetic administered is you've become used to it. You don't know how to fall asleep anymore, naturally. You've taught yourself to fall asleep using an anesthetic. So you, and you didn't do this in one night. It's not like one night you fell asleep drunk and woke up and you've forgotten how to fall asleep. You've, you've conditioned yourself to do this over months, years, maybe even decades. And so you've got to look at your kind of insomnia as a separate problem and start reading books on insomnia, start looking at your sleep hygiene. Is your bedroom the right temperature? Have you got a TV in your bedroom? You shouldn't get rid of it. Are you going to bed at the right time? Are you stopping caffeine before, you know, shouldn't be drinking any caffeine after lunch? 
Are there any other stimulants in your life? Are you drinking Red Bull? There's a huge list of things that you need to be, you know, checking. Um, and for the first couple of weeks, you're going to have to be pretty aggressive about this. You're going to have to be very strict with yourself and say, right, I will not look at my, t my phone screen two hours before I want to go to sleep. I will not watch TV. I'm going to read before bed. I'm going to make sure that the bedroom is a perfect temperature and that all sources of light are covered up. I'm going to remove the TV from the bedroom. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. But don't just say, you know, because I quit drinking now, I can't get to sleep. It's like one plus one equals 15. It's, it's part of the problem, but chances are the alcohol was just covering up another problem. So... Get started on your insomnia research, is what I'm saying. Uh, but then, good news from feeling supersonic. By week three, I was sleeping like a baby. Uh, you see, it's different for everyone. Uh, do, 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 do. <laughs> I, would, I would love to stay in the countryside with no neighbors. <laughs> yeah, it was good until lockdown. Then it, became, I, then it felt a bit like the world had ended. Uh, Zach, what do you think about alcohol addiction and childhood tra trauma? Um, yeah, I mean, look, 99.9% .9 of the people that come to me with, with problem drinking, and I've said this many times, the alcohol is not the problem. It is the symptom of the problem. And that problem is different for everyone. It can be trauma from childhood that you never dealt with that was so horrendous when you saw it as a childhood or whatever happened to you because you were too young to have the critical thinking and the maturity to understand what was going on and to detach yourself from it. Your brain tried to protect you by repressing it. it, buried it in your subconscious mind. Now, the problem with these buried demons is they don't die. They just mutate. And they come out later in life as phobias and fears and addictions and all these sort of things. So... Yeah, childhood trauma can be a catalyst for a drinking problem. But you got to deal with the drinking problem before you deal with the, the source because you can't really do anything successfully when you're drinking alcohol. So you take the alcohol out, but that's not the end of the journey. Because if you're drinking to cover up childhood trauma or a bad marriage or depression or anxiety, you're going to take away the coping mechanism and be left still with the original problem. So you're sober, but you're still miserable. So taking the alcohol out of the situation is step one on a powerful journey of change in your life. Go get some therapy. Go do timeline therapy. Go and speak to some mental health professionals to deal with those underlying issues that are causing you to drink is what I'm saying. Uh, how long have we been on now? 40 minutes. Okay, we'll do another 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> Emma. I was always a rubbish sleeper, so giving up alcohol has no difference. Yeah, I get you, Emma. Me and sleep are not friends. 4.30 uh, in the morning, my eyes open. Ding! Wide awake. 4.30. My wife, she can sleep till like 10. It's so annoying. Um, David, I stopped drinking years ago. I'm just popping in to give you thanks for your work and let everyone know that they can do it too. Thank you, David. I really appreciate that. And I'm sure people uh, here do as well. Uh, Hans Yolo, 5 a.m. in Canada. I hear you. <laughs> it's an overactive mind, I think. Um, Joe Hume, piano music. I'm off booze four months. Good thing to do is walk down your local street and watch people coming out of the pub at closing time. Reality stares you in the face. Yeah. It's uh, so you go out at two in the morning, sober. It's like a freak show. It's it's, it's kind of scary. Um. I was a heavy beer drinker, but stopped drinking from uh, last week. Feels good now. Keep going. Uh, what else we got here? Emma, I'm shy. I think uh, I, I think I drink to mask my self-esteem issues. Looking at ways to overcome this in social gatherings, I feel uncomfortable because I don't have the booze to fall back on to relax. Yeah, yeah I totally get that. Um, but the only, in my experience, the only way to conquer fear, Emma, is to expose yourself to the thing you're afraid of um, repeatedly until you become blasé about it. 
uh, that's, that's what I had to deal with, which is strange because I know I spent 20 years as a broadcaster, but that was be, you know, it was in a studio behind a microphone in my own environment that I controlled. Uh, when I, when my first marriage ended and I had to go talk to women, it was terrifying. I, I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know, I didn't ha know how to communicate. I was nervous. I was scared. And so I had, to, I had to learn how to do it. And I learned by exposing myself to the fear that I was afraid of. And the analogy I always make is, um, you know, it's like if I, if I took, took you, your hand now, Emma, and said, come on, we're going to jump out of an airplane, you, you'd probably say, oh, my God, that, no, that's terrifying. That's terrifying. I don't want to do it. If we did that 100 times, what would you say the 100th time I said, come on, we're going to jump out of an airplane? You might say, oh, do we have to? It's really boring. I'm so sick of that. You'd be so blasé about it. You'd be like, oh, how, how tedious. And so you just have to kind of go into performance mode, put on your actress's face, play the role of the gregarious person at the party. Fake it until you make it is what I'm saying. Uh, MGH1736. What a catchy username you have. I was nine months sober, felt fantastic, met someone who drank at weekends, and after a couple of months decided to share a drink with her. Big mistake, back to where I was, planning a sober future again. Yeah, it's, it's tough dating people who drink when you've given up. A, because they will try and pull you in to their circle because drinkers like company. They like the illusion of safety in numbers. And B, it's kind of hard. Once you've got it into your head that drinking poison for fun is suicidal, it's just a slow way of killing yourself. It's very hard to watch someone, someone you love slowly kill themselves. It's traumatic. It's difficult to be in that situation. Um, so it's a tough situation, so don't be too hard on yourself. Zach says it took 12 months for me to sleep properly. Long tea time walking. Okay. Uh, Mary Jane, alcohol took away my power, 19 months sober. Awesome job. Well done. Getting it back. Todd H., I'm now seven months alcohol-free. Still got the urges now and then. And when that happens, I go to the gym. An hour of weights and cardio knocks the cravings out. So true, Todd. Just pat and interrupt. What are you doing there? Pat and interrupt. It's like lesson one. It's awesome. You know, one of the first things I tell people to do at boot camp, I said, if you, if you ever get a craving to drink alcohol, go to the refrigerator, pour yourself a cold glass of water and sit down there and drink it in its entirety. Then ask yourself the question, do I still want a drink of alcohol? I bet you more than half the time you will say, no, actually, I don't. A, we tend to mix up the messages from our brain saying we're thirsty and we want to drink of alcohol. And B, drinking a cold glass of water slowly is a pattern interrupt. Normally, when you want to drink alcohol, you drink alcohol. You don't go and drink water. So it's a pattern interrupt in and of itself. It's powerful, but simple. Uh, do the, uh, cry fiston, do the thing you fear and the death of fear will be certain. <laughs> okay, I like that. Um, it reminds me of my favorite quote, that actually, you know, um, Steve Jobs, um, knowing that one day I'll be dead is the most empowering thought that I've ever had. Knowing that you are already naked, the, you've, you've already lost everything by the fact that one day you will cease to exist and all of this will not matter. So if you're putting something off because you're afraid of it, then understand how pointless that is because you'll take nothing with you. And that includes shame, embarrassment, regret, nothing. You'll, you, you will cease to exist. So you might as well just take the risks and do the, do the challenges and stuff you're afraid of because who knows what happens next, but maybe this is your only chance. Uh, Gary Bennett, almost 12 months sober after 25 plus years of drinking practically every day, apart from jail, uh, psychiatric units being skinned. I attended AA. Kind of have to at the moment due to circumstances. Gary, AA has its place. And it helps a lot of people, millions of people. And if it works for you, then you keep doing it. Uh, Craig Wright. Um, is it okay to listen to the hypnosis track more than once a day? More, oh, more than once. 
Uh, well, more than once, absolutely, I encourage it. Uh, and I would encourage you to do it every day for 21 days, for three weeks. And then you can do it as often or as little as you want. The reason I say 21 days, it's roughly how long it takes for a new habit to form. Uh, let me tell you when to listen to it. Craig, if you're a morning person, as in you go to bed early and you're bright as a button in the morning, like me, five o'clock in the morning, listen to your hypnosis track before 3 p.m. Do it in your lunch hour or find some moment during the day when you can listen. If you're a night owl, as in you want to stay up till the early hours of the morning, but you hate getting up in the morning, do your hypnosis track after lunchtime, after kind of two, three in the afternoon. Uh, you'll get better results doing it like that. If morning people listen in the evening when they go to bed, they generally fall asleep halfway through the track, in my experience. Kev Jackson, good to see you again, Craig. Thank you, Kev. Uh, uh, Cruzy, I've listened to Alcohol Lie to Me, audio book from start to finish three times in the last three years, and will more in the future. It's awesome. Now 970 days alcohol-free. Well done, superstar. Um, okay. Hayden Scott, until I read your book, I never saw a way out of the binge drinking. 133 days sober and never want to drink again. You, sir, are a legend. Although a few mates still struggle to accept the change. Yeah, they do. They do. But they'll get used to it. You just have to be kind of firm with them about it. You know, it, it's, a, it's a line in the sand for you. It's not a joke. It's not a fad. It's not a gimmick. It's important to you. And once they pick up on that vibe that you're serious about this, they'll, they'll back off. Just Sometimes you just have to kind of, you know, lay the, lay the law down. So we're going to wrap up there. Thank you very much for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, if you are worried about your drinking and you haven't yet taken action, then why don't you do yourself a huge favor and go to the website stopdrinkingexpert.com and sign up for today's free quit drinking webinar. I'll give you a copy of my best-selling book just for turning up and putting up with me wittering a bit longer. And uh, hopefully we can get you started on this amazing journey, stopdrinkingexpert.com. Thank you all, and we'll speak again very soon. Thanks a lot.